thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, we are hosting our Epilepsy Expert webinar series. The BC Epilepsy Society is proud to be hosting this webinar. Uh, BC Epilepsy Society has been educating, empowering, and supporting people living with and affected by epilepsy for over 60 years. My name is Kim Davidson. I'm the CEO and Executive Director for BC Epilepsy Society. I am also the founder of the International I'm a Voice for Epilepsy Awareness Campaign. I'll be your host for tonight's uh, webinar on adult epilepsy surgery and uh, an option for uh, seizure control for some adults with epilepsy may uh, be epilepsy surgery. Tonight, we will start off with Dr. Harazdale's presentation, followed by a question and answer period. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Chantal Harazdale. Dr. Harazdale did medical school at the University of Alberta and her adult neurology residency at UBC. After this, she completed a fellowship in epilepsy and EEG at the University of Calgary. She then moved back to BC as a UBC Division of Neurology Clinical Assistant Professor and an adult epileptologist at Vancouver General Hospital, where she has been a busy clinician since 2012. Yeah, it's a privilege to get to speak about epilepsy surgery. It's something I feel really passionate about. And it's something that dates back to when I first started my training uh, to be an epilepsy specialist in, in adult epilepsy. I had done a research program with my mentors at the time, um, one of whom was Sam Weeb, who is uh, one of the main leaders in epilepsy surgery research and has uh, proven the evidence base for this uh, intervention and the dramatic impact it can have on people's quality of life and improvement in seizure control. And we looked at patient perceptions and barriers to accessing epilepsy surgery. And one of the main things we found was the lack of education and information and knowledge about it. So it's part of my, you know, motive for giving a lecture like this. We also interestingly looked at neurologists knowledge and attitudes towards epilepsy surgery and published a survey uh, whereby it also came to our attention that there's a knowledge gap uh, around the role for epilepsy surgery and and uh, the way it can really be transformational uh, in uh, the quality of life with people uh, who are impacted by this uh, illness as well as their loved ones. And so uh, our goals for today's session are going to be to try and help empower you as a person with epilepsy or as a care provider or family member or loved one of a person with epilepsy to know more about the surgery and whether that's something that would be applicable to your circumstances. So what we're going to go through is we're going to identify who could be a candidate for epilepsy surgery. We're going to review briefly, uh, this isn't meant to be a medical boring lecture, but just a bit about the evidence behind the surgery itself and why we offer this intervention. We'll go through the process of surgery evaluation and what that entails. And then we'll highlight some of the different surgery options that are available, as well as the benefits and risks. And then lastly, we'll explore some of the coming surgical treatment options uh, for epilepsy, which are uh, in increasing and uh, particularly uh, exciting in recent years. So here we are with the brain. And as you may know, there's four main lobes of the brain, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. And what we're looking at doing when I'm talking about epilepsy surgery is usually we're looking at trying to find where is it on a given person's brain that there is this abnormal synchronized electrical activity causing seizures. And then if we're able to find where the seizures are coming from, the next question is, is that an area that a surgeon could safely resect by cutting out the abnormal area, or in some cases, uh, we may do a disconnection surgery where we disconnect that area from other areas of the brain. Or uh, more recently, uh, particularly in the United States, not so much in Canada, but newly in Canada as well, we're also starting to do things like laser ablation therapy or other sorts of therapies where we can destroy the abnormal seizure focus without necessarily cutting it out. So that's in a nutshell what we're going to be going into is uh, how do we decide if epilepsy surgery is appropriate for someone or what would we do uh, to make that decision and why.
So as people uh, present may already know, uh, the, the word epilepsy basically is used when a person has a predisposition to have repeated unprovoked seizures. And epilepsy affects up to 1% of the population of the world. So it's a very prominent condition. And the incidence is certainly increasing as the population ages. Focal epilepsy uh, associated with refractory seizures is something that is more common than generalized epilepsy and unfortunately may be harder to control than generalized epilepsy. Focal epilepsy, meaning the seizures start in one area of the brain and then they spread to variably become generalized. And sometimes the medicines are not perfectly effective in controlling seizures completely. And so this is a research trial uh, that was done way back in the year 2000 and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is uh, the main medical journal and a very important trial done by Dr. Martin Brody and colleagues. And what they showed is that when a person with epilepsy starts an anti-seizure medicine, they have an approximate one out of two or 50% chance, half of the pie here, of responding and not being disabled by seizures. However, that means the other half of people will not be seizure free with just trying one medication. If a person tries a second medication, they have about a 13% chance of uh, responding and being completely free from disabling seizures. But unfortunately, thereafter, whether somebody tries a third medicine or a 30th medicine, the chances of remaining seizure free long term are low and under 5%. And so this is where we get the group, which is about a third of the pie. It's about one out of three people with epilepsy who they are not responders to the medications 100%. It's not to say the medicines can't help and substantially improve quality of life, but they're not likely to make that group completely seizure free. And so the definition of drug resistant epilepsy is when a person with epilepsy fails adequate trials of two or more tolerated and appropriately chosen medicines that are at appropriate dosing and scheduling. Either one can be on its own or they can be together. But if that is not successful in achieving seizure freedom, then the person is defined as drug resistant. And that's usually when we would consider something like surgery. To emphasize, surgery is not a last resort, okay? It's a third resort after drug number one and two don't work. So I'll just say that again, surgery is not a last resort, and it should in fact be the first resort once somebody is defined as drug resistant epilepsy. And I'll explain the reason why. Now, firstly, before we move on, you might be wondering, oh, do I have drug resistant epilepsy or does my loved one have drug resistant epilepsy? So some of the key things is not just that you've tried two drugs, but it has to be a drug that's indicated for your type of epilepsy syndrome. It has to be at a therapeutic dose of the medicine. You have to have tried it for an adequate duration of time, which is drug specific and will be something your neurologist could help you to establish. Uh, ideally, uh, drug levels may be checked to ensure that you're in a therapeutic range or there's not drug interactions with other medicines you might be taking. And you can't have stopped the drug due to medicine side effects alone. That does not mean that the drug has failed. Okay. And of course, the medicine needs to be taken as prescribed without missed doses or uh, without going for intervals of weeks or months without taking the medicine. So interestingly, epilepsy surgery actually was uh, originally uh, studied and found to be of benefit here in Canada. And Dr. Wilder Penfield is a, a physician through the uh, Montreal Neurologic Institute here in Canada, who made uh, uh, tremendous uh, impacts in the, the role for uh, using surgery to treat traumatic epilepsy. And so people who have uh, trauma, bleed on the brain, uh, and subsequent seizures, it was found that resecting that abnormal brain tissue could cure the seizures and stop the seizures from happening altogether. Now, we've discussed this earlier when I had that picture of the brain. Here's a, a, a big summary statement that basically says, so when do you go for epilepsy surgery? So you go for resective surgery. This is considered in patients with drug resistant, uncontrolled, disabling focal epilepsy. If the seizures come from a part of the brain that can be removed with minimal risk of neurologic 
or cognitive dysfunction. So we can't just take out any part of the brain. Part of the job of doing the evaluation is to make sure that that is not an important part of the brain that's critical for the given person's function. And so we'll go through how we come to those determinations. In order to make these complex decisions, a person with epilepsy needs to have a team caring for them and performing what we call a surgical evaluation. So almost all people who are going uh, through the process of epilepsy surgery consideration will have the three things uh, listed uh, and we'll go through them together as well as um, other variably available uh, and variably ap applicable tests. So the first thing is called continuous video EEG monitoring. The second is MRI brain imaging and the third is neuropsychology testing. And so those are the mainstays of epilepsy surgery evaluation around the world. So what is the seizure investigation unit? That's the word we use for it here in Vancouver. You might read about epilepsy monitoring unit, seizure monitoring unit, they're all the same thing. The goal number one of this is that you actually come into hospital, you get admitted, you get the electrodes put on just like you would in a regular EEG over the scalp. And then there's a room that's set up for you with your own bed, your own washroom usually. And then you've got, you know, whatever to keep you entertained because it can be boring. You're basically stuck there in that room with those electrodes. The electrodes are limiting your mobility. So you can get up and go to the bathroom and back depending on the circumstances. Sometimes when people are at high risks for falls, they may not even have that uh, privilege um, and may just have to, to use a commode to use the washroom, for example. But the point of this is that you're on the bed hooked up and with, you, with the video watching you as well as the electrical waves being recorded. And we want to capture your events and see whether they are truly epileptic seizures. And if so, what do they look like? Some people have non-epileptic seizures that are not due to electrical activity on the brain. And this is the gold standard in order to tell whether a given event is due to epilepsy or not. Sometimes the scalp EEG doesn't show us the seizures perfectly, but usually that combined with the visualization of the videos and looking at stereotyped recognizable patterns allows the epileptologist to make a determination. The second goal of the seizure investigation unit is to try to localize if there are epileptic seizures, where on the brain are those seizures coming from? So here's an example of how we use the combination of the video and we'll watch some, some units have chairs that you can sit in. You're not necessarily always strapped right to the bed, but for the most part, what we're doing is we're looking at the video to see what are the movements that that person does? What are the feelings that they describe? How does their body look? What are they able to do? with talk and speak and move. And we use that information combined with the squiggly lines, which is the um, electrical potentials that we record over the uh, scalp, to then decide where on the brain those seizures are coming from. Sometimes we find that seizures are generalized and they start everywhere at once, in which case offering a, resectin, a resection for epilepsy surgery is, is not an option. But oftentimes the seizures will start somewhere focal and then they may or may not spread to look generalized on the EEG. And so that's the second goal is where on the brain are the seizures coming from? If you're found to have uh, non-epileptic events that aren't due to seizure activity, but other non-electrical abnormalities on the brain, then you would take a path that doesn't involve surgery any longer. And uh, you would continue to be followed along uh, by your physicians, but without a surgeon involved at that point. Now, the next main thing that we do, as I mentioned first, it's that epilepsy monitoring unit. The second thing is MRI brain imaging. This is absolutely critical to epilepsy surgery these days. Now, back in the days of Wilder Penfield, they didn't necessarily have MRI brain imaging and they were often using only CT scans or very limited uh, quality images. But nowadays, we actually have consensus worldwide. Um, and this is actually, again, a strong Canadian influence. Dr. Bernasconi and all uh, are a group that work out of uh, the Montreal Neurologic Institute in Montreal, again, with that history. These are standard protocols that are being 
being recommended that all centers use if they're going to try to find a structural abnormality on the brain that would be a potential focus for seizure. So there's certain sequences that are done, certain thicknesses and slices that are done uh, with the MRI imaging. And so when a person goes for an MRI, it's a non-invasive test. It doesn't cause any radiation exposure or injury. And it's a very uh, high sensitivity scan that allows us to look very carefully at the brain for whether there's any abnormalities compared to what we know a normal brain would look like. We're also often comparing sides of the brain one side to the other. So this is an example of the brain getting cut from top to bottom. We call that axial slices. This is an example of the brain getting cut from front to back, kind of like a loaf of bread. We call that coronal slices. And then these are sagittal slices, examples of the brain getting cut from uh, front to back. And so we use these sorts of images to try to look carefully and see where could there be focus for seizures. So here's an example of what an abnormal uh, focus for seizures might look like on an MRI brain. This is called mesiotemporal sclerosis, and there's an area where the hippocampus of the brain is bright. Uh, compared to the other normal side. And then it's also a little bit smaller and atrophic, and we can't see this gray-white differentiation the same on the abnormal as the normal. And so that's a, an example of an abnormality that we would find if we did the right sequences on the MRI. Another example of an abnormality that we might find is something uh, like a tumor. So here's an example of a, a lesion in the mesiotemporal region in this person's brain that you can see on the different sequences. And we use different uh, gadolinium enhancement and different features on different uh, kinds of films to better understand what we think this lesion is. And depending on where the lesion is and what it looks like, we can decide whether it's a likely cause for seizures, putting that in context with what the seizures look like on the video and on the EEG. Of course, half of people with epilepsy who are being evaluated for epilepsy surgery will in fact have a normal MRI brain and that makes the job a lot more difficult in terms of knowing exactly where you can afford to, to do a, a resection. The third main thing to do is called neuropsychology testing. So this is where it's really important to spend time testing what the brain's function is like. How does the person use their brain in order to engage in day-to-day -day important cognitive tasks like memory, like language, like attention, like visuospatial skills. And this can all be tested with different tasks with both paper and pencil, but also with computer uh, nowadays. And this is usually done over about one day. Sometimes people need breaks or they may break it up into two days, but it's about six hours or so of testing, depending on how long it takes the person, sometimes more, sometimes less, but to try and allow a neuropsychologist who's a specialist in testing for the details of cognitive function to give us an idea where is the brain working well and normal and then where is the brain maybe having some problems and how it's functioning compared to most people. There's other tests that can be done before surgery, but they're not done in everybody. And I don't want to overwhelm you with too much information because this can be, I mean, this is a whole, a whole field of medicine that, you know, people like myself train in for years to fully understand, but to at least give you some sense of what other tests you might undergo if you're being evaluated for epilepsy surgery, we'll go through each of these in a brief slide. So you may be asked to see a psychiatrist or a mental health professional. You may be asked to have a functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI to help understand your language networks. You may rarely, rarely be asked to have a WADA test, which is a test where we test language and memory, and that has historic significance here in Vancouver in particular which I'll explain. You may get asked to have some nuclear medicine studies done, including a PET scan, which stands for positron emission tomography, or a SPECT scan, which is single photon emission commuted tomography. And I'll show you some pictures and explain briefly what those tests mean. And then lastly, you may be advised to have what's called intracranial monitoring, which is where we put those EEG electrodes right over the brain under the skull, as opposed to uh, having them on the surface of the skull in order to be more accurate in localizing the seizures. <laughs> 
So the psychiatry piece is critical. And it's very rare that we have a person with refractory epilepsy who doesn't have substantial impact on their quality of life from those seizures and impact on their mood, anxiety, and day-to-day -day quality of life. And so we strongly value uh, the uh, opinion of a psychiatrist uh, who's part of our team uh, to help with uh, evaluating people before surgery to see if there's a role for any sort of counseling, uh, maybe meditation strategies, maybe medications to help manage depression or anxiety in advance of surgery. Because of course, mental health illness relates to brain dysfunction, just like epilepsy relates to brain dysfunction. And we want to make sure that we're treating the whole brain and all its manifestations of symptoms, whether those symptoms are seizures, headaches, or, or depression. And so we do also know that people who have challenges with depression or anxiety before surgery have higher risks of deteriorating from a mental health standpoint after surgery. And some people can get a worsening of depression or even a new onset of depression after an epilepsy surgery. So we want to make sure that that's all been looked at in advance and that we've got people following you and looking out for any signs of deterioration should you develop uh, problems after surgery. So this is something that's often available, but not always depends on the circumstances and uh, if you have any symptoms to suggest uh, effects on mood or anxiety. Another test that is uh, rarely done nowadays, but I think it's worth putting in, if only for historic interest, because this is a test that was uh, uh, designed by Dr. June Wada, who has practiced here in Vancouver uh, for many decades. And so it's historically uh, sort of dear to our hearts here in, in uh, BC. But what Dr. Wada did as a, a very uh, famous epileptologist who took care of adults with epilepsy in the province was he designed a test whereby we actually put in a catheter, the neuroradiologists uh, do that is, and we inject an anesthetic that puts half the brain to sleep. Just like if you go to sleep for an operation, the anesthetic puts half the brain to sleep by injecting into that side of the brain. And then what we do is we do testing of your ability to use speech and language while half the brain is put to sleep. And this lasts very briefly, about five minutes or so, no more than 10 minutes. And then we do the same thing on the other side. And the reason to do this is it helps us to understand what would happen if the surgeon was to do a surgery or cut out the area, the side of the brain where, where we're doing the injection. And this helps us to better mimic what it would be like to have a resection of a, an area uh, on the left versus right side of the brain. And it's a very uh, helpful test that we still use on occasion, specifically when a person has memory function that we're trying to understand, what would this person's memory be like if we injected on one side versus the other side? What would it be like if we took out a part of the brain on one side versus the other side? And this is the gold standard for understanding that in terms of language and memory. Although language nowadays, we're often able to better test with something called a language fMRI. And when I say better test, it's a lower risk test to do, and it's less invasive and less uh, time intensive. Um, this involves having you in the MRI machine, just like you'd have for an MRI that I just showed you now. But what this does is it gives you tasks in the MRI machine, and it looks at the changes in the way that the blood flow and uh, oxygen is uh, affecting the brain given uh, a task that involves, for example, language skills. And it will allow us to light up the area of the brain that's involved in that given function. So for example, this person's had some injury to the left side of their brain. Normally our language lies on our left side of the brain, but some people it's different. That's why we wanna be sure before we go and do a, an operation to cut out that part of the brain. And, and so we were able to map out where does the language light up in this person compared to where there's the structural abnormality. And you can imagine that this is a, a no-go and a go zone, uh, no-go zone for the surgeon and go zone for the surgeon in terms of where it's okay to uh, affect uh, the tissue and where you don't want to be, be doing any resection. The other uh, study that we use here uh, fairly frequently is called a PET scan. And a brain PET scan is where the person is looked at between their seizures. It's important they haven't had a seizure if possible for at least 24 hours before the study. And they get an injection of uh, uh, 
sugar molecule that's radioactive labeled. And this doesn't cause cancer. It's not dangerous for you, okay? But what it does is it goes in the blood. And then what happens is that there's imaging done. It's sort of like a CT scan. And then it lights up where there has been a metabolism of sugar that sugar molecule is going to be brighter and more present in regions where there's more metabolism. And so in people with epilepsy and seizures, the region where the seizures are coming from, in fact, is usually, think of it as often being scarred or damaged. It's, it's actually sick and it tends not to metabolize the sugar as well. And so you might see an area where there's low metabolism of sugar as compared to the normal area. And that is an area that is not functioning normally and can help. But particularly in people who have a MRI that looks normal and we don't have a lesion, or if someone has temporal lobe epilepsy and we're trying to understand if it's one side or the other side, and it doesn't look like there's a clear difference on the EEG or on the MRI, sometimes this study can help us to understand differences between sides by looking at how sugar is metabolized. The other thing that we can do is a SPECT scan, and this is a nuclear medicine study as well. And what we do is we look at the brain between seizures, and what we do is, again, it's a nuclear uh, material, uh, we use HMPAO, that gets injected, and then we look at how it's a measure of blood flow, basically, and we look at how the blood flows to the brain at rest when the person has not had a seizure for 24 hours. And then what we do is that we actually are able to inject the same compound into the person who's admitted to the epilepsy monitoring unit where we actually want seizures, you're in a safe environment, and there's an injection of the uh, product while having the seizure. And then that will flow to the brain more quickly and more focally to where the, the seizure has begun. And so if that injection goes in quick enough, then what happens is the person goes down to the scanner later it, within a four hour interval, they get their scan repeated and then the software subtracts the between seizure scan from the seizure scan. And then you can see this is an example of a subtraction scan and it lights up in this one area. Whereas when you look at the MRI, you may not have realized that that was abnormal. It, it, it's your cue to pay more attention and look at that area again. And we have technology that superimposes the scans on top of each other. And then the surgeon can use that information, especially if the scan otherwise doesn't show an obvious tumor or structural abnormality. So, okay, what if you've done all these things that I've just gone through, uh, and my apologies if that was boring or too exhaustive, but it just goes to show you that if you have an epilepsy specialist or neurologist who's talking to you about your seizures or you're wanting to ask questions about epilepsy surgery, this is not something that all neurologists do. It's something that epileptologists do that are specialists in seizure disorders. So it requires a referral to a surgical center in order to get all of this stuff coordinated and organized. And it's not something that happens in just a couple of days. It takes many weeks and months and sometimes even years to get it all sorted out. Okay. And you have time to think about things, ask questions, talk to others while you're going through the process. So we've done all this. What if we still don't know where the seizures are coming from? And that can still be the case. And so this is when you may have heard of what's called intracranial monitoring. So intracranial means inside the cranium. So that means under the bone. And so what we do is we use electrodes to record either over the surface of the brain or right inside the brain to better understand the electrical activity uh, without the confounding uh, factors of the skull being over top and uh, affecting the trajectory of the electrical signals that we're recording. So there's different kinds of electrodes out there. These ones that I'm showing you here are called grids. And so you can see you can get really big grids, eight by eight, that's 64 contacts, or you can get grids that are medium sized or smaller, or even what we call strips, which is just a single uh, run of these electrodes. Now, what happens is that this gets placed over the surface of the brain or it may get uh, placed under the surface or between hemispheres of the brain. And we record electrical activity from this uh, with the person's bone subsequently 
placed back on and I'll show you a picture of uh, a cartoon of, of what that looks like. Or there are other kinds of monitoring that we do is with depth electrodes where the electrodes, they look like they're little um, kind of like soft wires, uh, but they actually get fed into the brain via uh, guide um, that's uh, very rigid and they travel in a, a straight trajectory right into the brain. And I'll show you uh, some cartoons of this. So this is what grids look like. So they're placed over the surface of the brain under the skull or strips can get placed over the surface of the brain under the skull. Usually in order to put a grid in, always I should say, the surgeon does have to do a craniotomy where they cut the bone and remove the bone with you asleep in the operating room. They put the electrodes on and then they may slip some strips into regions that are say under the temporal lobe or between the hemispheres or this orbitofrontal region. And then what happens is those wires all get bunched together. And the surgeon puts the bone back on and then all of the wires get fed through the scalp and the skin and all that gets sutured up and you get a big head dressing on and then you end up with a bunch of wires hanging out and we record for up to a week or two sometimes to try to see exactly what the seizures are looking like on the EEG and the video. Some centers will do strip electrodes where the surgeon just makes little, we call them burr holes in the bone and then slips these little guys through the holes in the bone. Um, more often than not these days, uh, if people are going to have less invasive monitoring, instead of doing burr holes with strips through, what's often happening is depth electrodes are placed. And these are tiny, almost like needles that go right through the bone and through into, through all the, you know, skin and skull and uh, dura, the lining of the brain, and they go right into different areas of the brain that we would like to record over. And every spot that you see, like a little dot here is an electrode. So the electrodes aren't just at the end or aren't just at the uh, surface, they, they can travel the length of that electrode and allow us to record in many areas. So when you have subdural electrode placement, this is just an example of what that would look like. Of course, uh, this is just a model and most people would only have one side of the brain covered here, but I just wanted you to get some different visuals to understand what that looks like. And then for example, when the surgery is done, we could do x-rays or CT and this is what it would look like. These are the electrodes uh, that are under the bone and that then we get the data and then we go back to the OR and the surgeon reopens the bone with you asleep, takes out the electrodes and then hopefully is able to offer you a, a resection if we're able to find a seizure focus that doesn't overlap with important cortex. So that's subdural grids and strips. This is something that is historically uh, what we have been doing at Vancouver General Hospital in our adults with epilepsy. And around the world, this is something that has been uh, the original skill set that, uh, for example, Wilder Penfield used when I showed you those slides from the MNI. However, nowadays, and actually for many decades in certain parts of the world, certain parts of the US and Europe, what's been uh, more favored is the depth electrode placement because it's less invasive for the patient. And so what happens now is that we even have different robots available. And fortunately, uh, we now have a robot that's been uh, purchased uh, through philanthropy, both for Vancouver General Hospital and the BC Children's Hospital. So there's robots that help to be very specific about the placement of the electrodes with the, the epilepsy neurosurgeon, who is still the one actually feeding the electrodes into place. But this is an example of what happens is the robot has your MRI brain images, and then it knows exactly where we as a team of epilepsy specialists would like to place the electrodes, uh, combined with the, the surgeons and the neurologists and the neuropsychologists, we decide where to place the electrodes. And then the electrodes are placed with the person asleep in the operating room, 
with anywhere from maybe six to up to a couple dozen of these electrodes, depending on what kind of coverage we need. And then this is what it looks like at the surface is that there's these little pegs, they've been uh, put into place and screwed in with bolts. And then the person still has their head wrapped in a dressing and goes to the seizure unit for monitoring. But this is a lower risk intervention with less, uh, less uh, discomfort and it tends to be better tolerated by by, uh, patients, but there's pros and cons to doing these different interventions, and there's no bad or good or right or wrong. Um, the differences between the techniques often vary depending on the specifics of a person's epilepsy combined with expertise at their given center. So then what happens is once these electrodes are put in place, the person is readmitted to the seizure monitoring unit, just like uh, if uh, you had had the scalp video EEG monitoring first. As I explained, you get admitted to the hospital, you have the electrodes on. The difference here is that the electrodes are right over your brain as opposed to being over the surface of the skull and scalp. And then the meds are usually brought down. Sometimes we don't even need to bring meds down. You may be sleep deprived to try to bring on seizures. And then we use that data uh, watching the video, and then we put together the electrical information from where the electrodes are placed on the brain to get a better understanding of exactly where the seizures are starting in the brain and exactly which electrodes are affected versus not affected. We can also, depending on the location of the electrodes, we can provide electrical current. It doesn't hurt the person, but it allows us to see what would happen if we were to mimic a lesion or a cutting out of that area. And it allows us to map function of the brain in the given patient. So whether that's their motor function for strength, whether that's their language function, their sensation, these are things that we can can map on your brain with electrodes specific to you. So it makes it a very, very individualized investigation. And then what happens is the whole epilepsy team gets together and we have weekly conferences and this happens at all centers around the world where the teammates all discuss the different components of the person's seizures, what they look like on the video, what they look like on the EG, on the MRI, the neuropsychology testing, and sometimes the nuclear medicine studies. If the person had intracranial monitoring done, that gets reviewed as a whole group. And the group makes a recommendation about whether they think epilepsy surgery is advisable or not. And then they'll also make a recommendation of what kind of epilepsy surgery it is that they're recommending. And then at that point, the person would have a follow-up with their neurologist, usually their, their epilepsy specialist. And if they're interested in going through with the surgery, then they meet the neurosurgeon. And so if you're felt to be a good candidate, uh, you have a, a consultation with the surgeon, at which point the surgeon can go through the specific benefits and risks of whichever procedure is being recommended. And you'll be asked to sign a consent form and be placed on the wait list for an OR. And so what, what's, what's uh, our rationale for doing all this fancy stuff and cutting out parts of the brain? Well, I thought it was worth showing uh, uh, this pivotal trial, which was published again in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2001. And this was uh, Dr. Sam Weba, who I was fortunate to train under, um, who did this randomized control trial out of London, Ontario. So again, a piece of Canadian history in epilepsy surgery. And he has showed that surgery is superior superior, far superior, better than prolonged medical therapy in people who have medically refractory temporal lobe epilepsy. So temporal lobe epilepsy is when seizures come from the temporal lobe, and this makes up the majority of adult epilepsies. And so this trial did a, a fabulous job of randomizing people to getting epilepsy surgery either within four weeks right away or people had to go on a wait list, which was the standard of care at the time, which was a one year wait list for surgery. And there were 80 patients followed and they were randomized to getting a temporal resection on whether it was their right side or their left side that depended on the individual patient and what kind of you know, seizures they were having. Um, but everybody had a standard procedure uh, where the temporal lobe was resected, both the surface and the mesial uh, inside portion of that temporal lobe was resected. 
And what that study showed is that they looked at the number of people who had no disabling seizures after one year from the surgery. And you can see the people who had no surgery while they were waiting for surgery for a year, only 8% had no disabling seizures for that year, whereas 58% had no disabling seizures uh, after having had that surgery. And so that means the number needed to treat is two. So you need to treat only two people in order to have somebody free from disabling seizures. That's an extremely good odds ratio for any medical intervention. Complete seizure freedom at one year was 3% in the group just on medications versus 38% on the group that had the temporal resection. So again, the number needed to treat was very small. Only three people needed to be treated with surgery for someone to be completely seizure free at a year. And you can say, well, what's the difference between no disabling seizures and complete seizure freedom? The difference is that people in this group may still get a warning aura, but not progress to a seizure where they have impaired awareness or certainly not progress to any kind of convulsions or falls or injuries. But these are usually aura that are minimally bothersome to people. So we still consider this to be a success. I should highlight, by the way, that even if you do not have uh, freedom from disabling seizures, there are higher numbers of people that still benefit from the surgery in terms of fewer seizures and better quality of life. But if you're setting a really strict goal of complete seizure freedom or no disabling seizures at all, it goes to show that the numbers can be very positive compared to medicines alone. So what are the risks of having epilepsy surgery? Well, intracranial monitoring is associated with minor or temporary complications in under 5% of people. And this is based on a systematic review that was done, led by Dr. Walter Hader um, with the Calgary Conference of Epilepsy Program, uh, looking at all the literature published to date. Major or permanent complications from epilepsy surgery make up only about half a percent. Okay, so all things considered, the risks of surgery are substantially lower than the risks of having refractory seizures ongoing. And I think a lot of people are worried about, oh, but what if I have the surgery and then I'm not going to be able to move my other side or I'm not going to be able to talk or I'm not going to be able to see half my visual world. We would not recommend a surgery if we thought that you were likely to have a deficit like that with a resection. So these are numbers based on group recommendations that a person with epilepsy proceed with the surgery. So this is just showing you specifically uh, if you proceed with resective surgery, as opposed to what I was describing here is the process of the intracranial monitoring where you have the electrodes over the brain to get the data. Neurologic complications that are minor make up 5%. Major, it makes up about 1%. What is, what's major and minor? Well, the neurologic com uh, complications that are minor might, for example, be that you have a little bit of double vision after the operation, but that resolves after six months because uh, a, a nerve got a little bit pulled on with traction. That would be considered minor. A major neurologic complication would be something like a stroke or uh, a bleed that led to a new neurologic deficit or an infection, a meningitis that led to uh, bad headaches and needing to be on medications. Those are examples of major complications. Only 1.5% of people who go through epilepsy surgery are left with permanent weakness on the opposite side of their body. And that may or may not have been something that was predicted or uh, felt to be a higher risk depending on the location of the surgery. Death is extremely low. 0.4% uh, death with an epilepsy surgery. And uh, the risks of uh, the refractory seizures over a person's lifetime are, are far, far greater. Although, of course, you do take some risks up front when you have any surgical intervention. Now, this was uh, some slides I wanted to show from this survey I had done as a trainee doing my fellowship in epilepsy. And we asked patients, what are your goals with regards to your epilepsy? Uh, what are important goals for you? And you can see that this is a, a number of different goals, better concentration and memory, um, better relationships with family and friends, better, be, be better able to plan my future, to not need to be looked after or taken care of to not worry about hurting myself or others, to stop all seizure medicines, or to at least not have seizure side effects, 
to take part in new activities or to be able to hold a steady job or go to school, to be able to drive, to never have another seizure. So these are really common goals that people have when they have epilepsy. And a lot of people are able to get these goals achieved with the use of medications and adjustments to medications. But often if you're in that one out of three, that group of the pie there that's medically refractory, it's hard to achieve those goals without considering surgery. And I do find surgery is extremely effective with achieving some of these goals in a, in a lot of patients, such as uh, not having seizures or not having disabling seizures, uh, very potentially being able to go to drive and to work and go to school, participate in extracurricular activities. We'll get to this, um, not have to feel like they're taken care of by others or dependent on others, better able to plan their future, have relationships and families. What the surgery is not likely to do is have you stop all your anti-seizure medications, okay? Because most people with epilepsy who have a surgery still benefit from being on some anti-seizure medications. So it's important to set those expectations. Although some people are successfully able to come completely off medicines, it's about 15%. The other 85% are not completely off medicine seizure free. They still need some medicine usually. And so that's not to say that we can't work as a team to find medicines that are not having side effects that bother you. The other thing that surgery doesn't always solve is this part here, to have better memory and concentration. So depending on the kind of epilepsy that you have, if it's temporal lobe epilepsy, you may already have had damage to the brain in a way that's irreversible to, to areas that involve memory function, for example. And so sometimes we even take out uh, the hippocampus, the temporal lobe that surgery I showed you is involved in, that area that we resect is involved in memory function. So it's very possible that the memory and concentration do not necessarily uh, change or get substantially better after the surgery. But sometimes we do find improvements just by virtue of the fact the person's no longer having seizures, the person may be sleeping better, the person may have uh, a better ability to tolerate um, fewer, like come down on meds and have fewer meds that are contributing to some of those challenges. So, but this is just important that we're setting your goals uh, um, with realistic expectations of the surgery, but it's certainly uh, much uh, more likely uh, to help uh, these goals than just the medicines, if, if surgery is something we can offer you. Balancing risks is what this is all about, isn't it? So we talked about some of the risks of surgery and we talk, however, less often about the risks of the seizures themselves. And so I just wanted to put this slide in there to remember. I say uh, in this question that I ask the people with epilepsy in the clinic, which of the following are problems that sometimes happen for people that have seizures? And sure enough, you can see here, not being able to drive, relationship dis difficulties, discrimination, problems concentrating, drug side effects, troubles with school and job, status epilepticus, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patients, seizure-related injuries. These are risks that add up and are substantially higher than the risks of surgery if we recommend surgery to you. Sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patients is something I wanted to at least put a slide on because unfortunately, if you fall into the group where we're looking at epilepsy surgery, the chances of you having an unexpected death often in sleep, presumably somehow related to a seizure, can be as high as 0.5 to 1% per year if you're in that particular group of people with epilepsy. There's websites and resources that you can read more about this and the best we can do to prevent this is to optimally control seizures. We know that rates of SUDEP are markedly lower in people who've gone through epilepsy surgery as opposed to those who do not. The surgical recovery period is something that I wanted to give you a little bit of expectations about. So the hospitalization for the surgery is usually around four to six days, and the recovery will usually take a few weeks afterwards, although the person's often able to go home by that point. You may be advised to take a few months off of work or school and studies to recuperate at home, and it's often that people will have some headaches, will find that they're more fatigued for some time. It's a big operation to have a craniotomy and have a part of the brain removed and it does take a period of about two to three months for most people to recover. 
you'll see your epilepsy specialist and surgeon and follow up and we're always happy to help with any kind of paperwork that might be needed for school or work or whatever it is uh, to explain your circumstances and a potential need for accommodations. So after you've gone through all that, we do know that the outcomes after epilepsy surgery in subsequent studies, looking at different groups, not just temporal lobe epilepsy, are showing that it's approximately two out of three people with temporal lobe epilepsy who remain seizure free in follow up. And the follow up shows that over time, the number of seizure free cases does sometimes drop the longer you follow people up, but we're still looking at a really good long term success rate. This was just a slide to highlight what I already explained to you, that the longer we follow people up, then the chances of them staying seizure free, so this is on one seizure medicine, on two or more seizure medicines, and on no seizure medicines. And these are the percentages of people who are seizure free over time. So the original data versus follow up at five years, original data, follow up at five years, original data, follow up at five years. So over five years from the surgery, it's only 15% of people in this study of about 3,500 patients with different uh, temporal and non-temporal uh, surgeries where they were seizure free completely off medicines. And the lesson we learn from this is that we generally don't uh, stop medicines in adults with epilepsy um, if they can tolerate the medicine and it's not having side effects, um, we'll often at least have a person on one drug long term. And there's all these different kinds of outcomes we can look at besides seizure freedom. Everybody looks at seizure freedom or number of seizures, but there's substantial neuropsychological outcomes that can be better, like uh, significant uh, changes in memory or thinking. The risks um, are generally higher for a memory decline if you're having your left uh, dominant hemisphere uh, surgery, if it's involving language areas or memory areas. We can look at social outcomes like full-time employment, driving, lifestyle, relationships, education, finances, all of these things are something that we've looked at and measured as outcomes that are better in people with epilepsy surgery. Overall, people with psychiatric conditions have an improvement or no change as a, as a general statement, but any individual may have a risk for a decline and there is a well-established risk of depression after temporal lobe epilepsy. But these are things that often actually impact the person's quality of life and outcome as much as the seizures is, is the mood and depression. And quality of life studies have showed that 91% of all studies published for epilepsy surgery are showing a positive effect on quality of life. So yes, there's some people who don't get benefit from the surgery. There's a very small percentage of people who are harmed by the surgery, but the huge majority are glad that they went through with the surgery, even if not completely seizure free. Now I'm conscious of the time and so maybe I'll just go more quickly through this. I'm happy to stay and answer questions as long as needed, but I wanted to make sure you understood in a few slides that it's not just cutting out a piece of the brain that's an option. Sometimes there's other kinds of surgeries that can be done that are called palliative options, meaning that they're not intended to completely stop the seizures, but they can often make a marked reduction in seizures and an improvement in the person's quality of life. So the vagal nerve stimulator is an example of one of those kinds of surgeries. We don't understand the exact mechanism. This has usually been used more in children than adults, but we've been starting to put a substantial more uh, number of these in adult patients in BC. In the United States and around the world, this is a well-established, very commonly used treatment for epilepsy. And it's used in people who have refractory epilepsy who aren't good candidates for resective surgery. And what this does is it's a surgery, the person gets put to sleep, we put a little, it's like a pacemaker device in the chest wall under the skin, and then there's an incision there as well as a small incision in the neck, where the surgeon attaches a wire and wraps this wire around the vagal nerve. And what happens is that this delivers a current to the vagal nerve in a cyclic fashion, which we can adjust the settings. And this, this is neuromodulation. It affects the brain in a way that changes that seizure threshold and lowers the likelihood of seizures. In some cases, uh, it can change so the seizures aren't convulsions or aren't leading to falls or injuries. It's effective in about 50%, if not greater, of people who have a vagal nerve stimulator implanted. They'll report that they've had a 50% or greater reduction in their seizures. <clears throat> 
They'll also report that they've noticed perhaps that the seizures are shorter, that they don't have as long of a post seizure phase or recovery phase. Um, they feel that they are maybe having better attention and concentration and alertness and mood. Uh, sometimes they're coming down on their other seizure medicines because of the benefits of the vagal nerve stimulator. So this is something that uh, should strongly be considered. And it's a day procedure. It's a, it's a relatively minor operation with low risks, aside from small risks of infection and bleeding with any operation and small risks of damage to structures in the neck or nerves. Um, this is something that most people are able to do with, with small risks compared to the risks of the seizures themselves. A corpus callosotomy is a disconnection where the surgeon uh, accesses the brain through a craniotomy, a hole in the skull, and then does a disconnection between the left and right hemisphere of the brain by severing these uh, neurons that go from left to right. They're called the corpus callosa. And usually the surgeon will do this for the front two thirds of the brain. And this is usually reserved for people who have severe convulsions or drop attack seizures that lead them to fall and hit their head and be injured and have um, a, fall, a fall risk and convulsion risk that's very substantial. This is a surgery that's done relatively infrequently in adults with epilepsy, and it does have potential cognitive side effects, which make it less desirable as a first choice, but it can be hugely effective uh, if chosen uh, in the right population. And it's quite phenomenal how high-functioning people can still be, even though this anterior two-thirds of the corpus callosum has been severed. The back third is still left intact most of the time, and that still allows for uh, communication between hemispheres. Rarely, a surgeon will do what's called a multiple subpeel transection, where the surgeon goes under the cortex and severs the connections of those neurons between adjacent neurons. And the reason this is done is that if it's an area that's an important area of the brain that cannot be cut out, like, say, an area that's important for motor function, then this is an example of a procedure that can be done to sever connections so the neurons are less likely to all communicate and cause the, the seizure, the motor seizure usually, but uh, it's not not going to cause the neurologic deficit of weakness. Unfortunately, this is not a very effective procedure. It does help in some cases, but it's not expected to be curative. And it doesn't necessarily stop some seizures from still progressing and generalizing. Rarely in children more so than adults, there may be a hemispherectomy where the surgeon disconnects the hemisphere while leaving the brain inside. And this is uh, something that's quite nuanced and rarely done in adults, but here's some examples of pediatric conditions where this may be done in children. I have had a couple of my adults with epilepsy go through a hemispherectomy um, in our adult epilepsy program, and there's rare indications for it. But just to highlight to you that sometimes just doing a cut where we're severing connections but not actually removing the tissue can make a big difference. There's newer options in the management of epilepsy. Unfortunately, none of these options are currently available to adults with epilepsy in British Columbia. And in fact, I would suggest that most centers in Canada do not have these uh, therapies yet available. But I want to make sure you're aware that there is a lot of development ongoing and a lot of excitement around additional ways that we can further improve seizure control beyond doing the cutting uh, that we've previously spent our time discussing today. So there's a, a trial where there's a little electrode uh, that gets placed on both sides into the hippocampus, and then it's stimulated routinely, regularly on a cycle, kind of like what I showed you with the vagal nerve stimulator in people with bilateral temporal lobe epilepsy. There's also studies that have looked at the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. There's two depth electrodes, and this can help people with generalized seizures as well as focal epilepsies. This has been shown to work about the same as the vagal nerve stimulator if not better, some studies show 60 to 70% of people will have an over 50% reduction in long-term follow-up. But this is something that carries risks because you are putting depth electrodes into the brain and it has not been approved uh, for use uh, thus far. Uh, there aren't surgeons doing this that I'm aware of in Canada, but uh, it is something that the uh, Americans uh, and in Europe, they've been doing for well over a decade now in some patients with epilepsy.
Finally, uh, very fascinating work is being done with what's called responsive neurostimulation, which is where this is like a little pacemaker device that I showed you for the vagal nerve stimulator. This gets placed under the skull at the hairline, under the hair, and then it's attached to those electrodes. They can be depth electrodes or they can be little strips, subdural strips. There can only be two contacts so far with the technology we have. And what happens is that these will record and detect seizures. And when this device detects a seizure, it gives it an electrical current and a zap, and that can act to short circuit and stop a seizure from then progressing. And so this is a really exciting technology that can be used in people who we know where the seizures are coming from, but maybe there's more than one area, or maybe it's an important area of the brain that cannot be resected. This is a more focused way to try to stop seizures. Um, and it's, however, not likely to be curative either. Its success rates are on the range of 60 to 70% of people will say that they've had a 50% or greater reduction in seizures, although like the VNS, it's not likely to stop seizures altogether. This is a highly costly and resource intensive uh, option that is not yet available to people with epilepsy in Canada, but they are doing this in the States. Other things like using a gamma knife or radio surgery to try to target an area in the brain where the seizures are coming from is still going to damage the brain, okay? And that can still lead to deficits, but it's less invasive and it has some small role. We're not really using it so much at Vancouver General Hospital for adults with epilepsy, but there's small roles for it in certain environments. What has gained a lot of interest and has become standard of care in the United States these days is what's called stereotactic guided laser ablation therapy. And what this is, is it's using a laser to guide destruction of tissue in the region where the seizures are coming from without actually cutting that region out. This has pros and cons. As you can imagine, you don't get the tissue under the microscope. You can't confirm if this is thought to be a tumor, if it's in fact a tumor or not. But it does allow you to destroy tissue focally without necessarily destroying tissue along the path. This is something that um, there are uh, different surgeons in Canada that are acquiring this skill set and starting to apply this as it pertains to epilepsy surgery. At present, we're not using this technology at Vancouver General Hospital, but there are other Canadian uh, adult epilepsy centers that are. So in conclusion, surgery may offer freedom from disabling seizures in people who failed medications. Various tests are used to help tailor the benefits and risks of surgery on an individualized patient by patient basis. One must balance the risks associated with the surgery with the risks of the poorly controlled epilepsy and seizures. And an epilepsy surgery should definitely not be considered a last resort. If, if you've taken nothing else from my talk today, please ask your doctor about it. If this is uh, something that you think you would uh, be a good candidate for or a loved one would be a good candidate for based on the discussion that I've uh, generated today, um, it's worth asking your doctor about and uh, considering a referral to an epilepsy uh, specialist who can discuss further with you or if you have an epilepsy specialist specialist, you are welcome to bring up any of these uh, different surgical options with them. So at that point, I'd like to end off and uh, ask if anybody has any remaining questions, uh, anything that I haven't covered, or if there's something I went through that you want to ask more about, I'm happy to answer those questions. So I've got a question uh, about a person who has had a, a daughter with a subdural electrode placement and temporal lobe resection back about a decade ago and was seizure free for 13 months afterwards, but started having seizures again. Could she be a candidate for further surgery? That's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that question. It's a huge topic to cover. And I neglected to highlight that just because you've had epilepsy surgery once and it didn't stop the seizures does not mean that you can't potentially benefit from another epilepsy surgery evaluation and consideration of epilepsy surgery again. It's just like if somebody has cancer and they have a tumor and they go for an operation and the surgeon thought they got it all, but then they didn't, then that person can go back and have further resection, okay? Same thing goes with epilepsy surgery. 
depending on the specifics of the type of epilepsy and the type of surgery done, we will often consider a person for a second or sometimes even a third epilepsy surgery. It usually requires that we repeat some of the tests that were already done before or that we repeat certain components of those tests. We want to make sure that the seizures that we're having now are the same seizures as before or if they're different, in what way are they different? Do we need to record those on EEG monitoring again? Do we need to repeat neuropsychology testing and imaging of the brain? Uh, but absolutely, a person who has had surgery once can still potentially benefit from surgery again. With that caveat, I would say that it's well established that your chances of seizure freedom with epilepsy surgery are greatest when you go the first time. Okay. Um, I also had a question, how big an area is resected? Does it vary and why? And specifically, what a, for the temporal lobe? Very good question. Okay, so let me just get my temporal lobe uh, 3D, approximate size of the human brain. Okay, so the area that's resected depends totally on your epilepsy and what we think the network looks like and how bad we think the, the actual size of your lesion is, how that overlaps with important cortex. So the size of the area that gets resected could literally be as small as, oh gosh, I don't know. Um, like, you know, this top part of my thumb or pen here, like it could be quite a small resection depending on what the, the problem is or what the focus for seizures is. In other cases, believe it or not, we could take out something the size of, oh geez, I don't have very many 3D, uh, I have an apple in my lunch, but it's all chopped up. Like literally the size of an apple, sometimes it could be that big, a whole frontal resection could come out that big. Specifically with a temporal resection, it, de it just depends on the individual. And sometimes the brain's already really damaged. Maybe there's been an old stroke or something like this. But so this is the front of the brain, the back of the brain, the top and the bottom. This is the temporal lobe right here. I'm just going to take it out so you can get a visual of how big it is. And I'll show you what the surgeon will take out of it. So this is the temporal lobe now. This is the front and this is the back. And so the surgeon will actually uh, know, like with the anatomy, but you could even measure with a ruler, okay, about four centimeters back from the tip, if it's a temporal resection, uh, all the way to five, it depends on whether the surgeon's doing the resection in the language dominant hemisphere or not. And then the surgeon will cut that hunk out right through including the hippocampus is usually what we're invo is involved in the memory network. The amygdala and hippocampus is this blue structure. So what does that end up being the size of? I'd say that's the size of a uh, good healthy apricot or plum or something. It's a, it's a fair amount of brain tissue that can come out in a temporal resection. And, and sometimes that can be a scary thought like, well, why are you taking out that much of my brain? But you know what? It's kind of just like Vancouver Realty, right? It's about the cost of that real estate, right? You can buy land, like acres and acres of it, if you're going to go live, uh, I don't know, maybe up in Terrace or something uh, where it's cold and wintry, or you can try and get a little 500 square foot condo in downtown Yaletown, Vancouver. And the cost of that real estate is dramatically different. And it's the same thing with your brain. And believe it or not, the cost of that real estate, when we take out that whole front temporal lobe, isn't seeming to be worth the risk of the seizures still happening if we leave stuff behind. So for now, that's our approach is we'll often take that much of the temporal lobe in a temporal lobe epilepsy case. That's the best chance for success. There are studies going on that look at the surgeon just taking out a small area, like for example, that hippocampus and amygdala that blue area and trying to leave the rest of the brain intact. And those studies have been going on for decades and surgeons have developed expertise. We call it a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. They just take out the small area like my pen here. Okay, like the tip of my pen. And, and they followed these people over time and showed that they're at a higher risk for recurrent seizures. So there's this balancing of pros and cons. 
there's some suggestion that people who have the selective procedure may have better performance on some of their memory and language tests that we do after the surgery. But it's, uh, it's a difficult call to, to weigh those pros and cons when you're looking at group data. Most of the time we feel like doing a full on block resection is the way to go in temporal lobe epilepsy in adults. But all, everything I say has to be individualized to the specifics of a given person. Sometimes there's a lesion in the temporal lobe, like a tumor or a vascular abnormality or scarring, and then the surgeon can just lop that out and they don't have to do that whole big resection. Right. And, and so Dr. Harasdale, if I, if I may, yeah. um, just because I think that for people who are watching this, who aren't, um, you know, this is, this is quite scary for them to see. Yeah. And, and, and uh, the risk of having refractory and that drug resistant uh, epilepsy, ongoing seizure activity, the risk of that happening to the brain is so much more serious and critical than what we're talking about when we're talking about surgery. And I, I, I just want to revisit that, that um, in terms of when we're talking about SUDEP and we're talking about um, for every year that you go with refractory uh, drug resistant epilepsy, or that's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it's 1% is added for each year that that goes, that you go on living like that. So if you've gone 20 years with refractory epilepsy, it's 20%. Um, that equals 20% added risk to suit up. Um, this is uh, a statistic. Um, if you go 30 years, 30% risk. Um, and the number goes up. Yeah, um, is it's that a something very that scary number. And it's a very important number for people to be mindful of when worrying about risks of the surgery. The other things that people need to remember is that, so the risk of death is way higher. Your risk of dying in the next calendar year, if you have refractory epilepsy, okay, is about 0.5 to 1%. And your risk of dying from an epilepsy surgery in one day is far, far lower, but you live every day of your life and year of your life. So those risks are building on each other every year, whereas that's not the case with the surgical risk that you take, right? There's also risks to not having the surgery that extend far beyond, and there are numbers that are even higher, um, that extend far beyond just death, right? But like the quality of life risks that people take in terms of, um, you know, there's medical issues, falls, injuries, traumatic head injuries, broken bones, dislocated limbs, all those kinds of things, um, accidents from seizures. But there's also uh, the fact that the seizures affect you and your brain in a way that's cumulative over time. It's going to impact your emotional well-being, your mental health. It's going to impact your social relationships, your work, your self-confidence. It's going to impact your cognition and your memory. Um, sometimes when people are worried about a temporal resection specifically and that their memory could get a bit worse, the reality is if you keep having those seizures, the memory often does get worse over time anyways because the, the damage that happens from the seizures ongoing. Now, I don't want to sound like a fear monger here, okay, because I literally just saw a lovely patient today in her 60s who's had refractory temporal lobe epilepsy, is working full time and is living independently. And it's not to say that everybody is more abundant with this condition, and I don't want to sound like that. But, but I think that what's so rewarding is that when you can see people who've had a life of disability then go to surgery and live a, a life that's totally transformed, you often look and say, man, why didn't we do that five years ago, 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or in some adults, uh, you know, 50 years ago, believe it or not, we're seeing people who could have been uh, candidates long, long ago. The average adult waits uh, about... Uh, 15 years before going for epilepsy surgery. So it, it shouldn't be that long a wait. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do with education, like I mentioned at the very beginning. Right. And, and so in terms of the, and, and I'm so grateful for the definition that you gave for drug resistant epilepsy, the, the two AEDs. Um, mm -hmm. So you've tried those, your, those uh, two medications. Uh, and, and then so that surgery is a third resort and not a last resort. So thank you for that. And mm -hmm. thank you to, for defining that people can go back in and, and, and rewatch uh, this webinar 
Um, knowing that surgery is not a, a it is the third resort and not a last resort. What is the wait list for brain surgery if it is an option for adults um, with epilepsy in this province? And, and this province is a little unique because we do send adults uh, for brain surgery in other provinces, uh, to yeah. other provinces. And, and we're fortunate because since we can't meet the need here, it is an option for us to send them out of province. Yeah. Um, it's bittersweet. Um, uh, but what is the wait list currently? Yeah. So the wait list is hard to define because what happens is it's not like a person who has a hip replacement need gets put on a wait list and then needs to wait. The thing about this is, as I explained in my talk, and I think it's pretty apparent, it's a process that you go through. So there's going to be waits along the way. I'd say in general, the wait for an adult with epilepsy who's first referred to our clinic we're doing well. We've had an increase in resources in the last several years. And so generally speaking, people aren't waiting more than six months to get into the clinic, sometimes only one month. Uh, depends on the urgency surrounding the referral and the specific context. But most adults with epilepsy in BC are probably waiting I don't, this is, I don't have statistics for you, but I'd say from six months to many years. Um, sometimes uh, because of historic resource challenges, people have been waiting like well over five years, unfortunately, because of limitations in some of those tests that we have, like that intracranial monitoring and also even the scalp EG monitoring. But that's where sometimes we do send people out of province to try to get things moving. And we've done um, a lot of advocacy and, and have been very appreciative uh, for the BC Epilepsy Society's advocacy and philanthropy that's coming in lately to help uh, improve some of these gaps. As everyone knows with COVID, it's very hard to make a push for more uh, funding, but that is something we're trying to do as Kim knows well and, and uh, make this wait list shorter. Yeah, with that comes the education and the awareness pieces. We've asked our constituents, they knew this was happening today, to send in their questions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so here's one. I've been on eight AEDs, refractory, um, for over 20 years. My neurologist does not believe I should get a VNS or go for brain surgery. Can I self-refer to the epilepsy clinic uh, for another opinion? Uh, okay. Well, I think that's very important that if you feel like whoever is taking care of your epilepsy um, is uh, giving you an opinion that you'd like to have seconded, then then ask for a second opinion. There, You have that right. In fact, we have patients within our own clinic uh, who will ask to see a different epileptologist to get a, a different opinion. And, and when it gets this complicated, it sounds like if this person's had this many seizures and this many uh, different challenges, it's very much uh, worthy of an opinion from an epilepsy specialist. The way our system works in uh, Canada and uh, in British Columbia uh, is that you cannot, as a patient, refer yourself to a specialty physician. You need a referral, but it doesn't have to be that your neurologist refers you to our clinic. It could be that your family practitioner refers you to our clinic, or if you have another uh, person involved in your uh, medical health, whether it's a psychiatrist or an internist or anybody can refer who's a physician or a nurse practitioner, um, but you could absolutely be referred to our clinic for an opinion. And there could be very good reasons why your neurologist doesn't think you're a good candidate for the VNS or for other surgeries, but that's going to be something that um, you're entitled to another opinion from, from somebody who, who does the surgery evaluations. All right. I can see that there's another question here on, uh, on screen here. How do you determine mm -hmm. cognitive loss after surgery, uh, surgical risks and recovery, and how does age factor in? Does recovery depend on brain elasticity and how so? Yes. So how do we determine cognitive loss after surgery is uh, via neurologic examinations at the bedside in the first several days and weeks after the surgery. Um, as neurologists and neurosurgeons, we have ways of testing specific neurologic function and we'll hone in depending on what we're expecting might be different after the surgery. The more complex cognitive functions that 
our brains do day to day uh, beyond simple ability to recognize, uh, you know, ability to understand and speak language and remember certain simple information is best test tested by neuropsychologists. So that's why all epilepsy programs have a neuropsychologist who's a psychologist with extra training in in neuropsychology. And their job is to do those paper and pencil tests, computer tests, basically a super beefed up equivalent of, I guess people, uh, the, the common lay term would be like an IQ test, I guess. Like they look at IQ, but they look at all these other things as well in their testing. The neuropsychologists will look at attention and speed of processing and all these different factors, language memory. And then we have numbers, like they'll, they'll do these tests on you before the operation and then after the operation and compare your before to your after. And there's often areas that get better actually. Uh, more often than not, there's areas that improve because the person's no longer having seizures, for example, but then there might be an area that gets worse, and that's how we can objectify that. Um, surgical risks and recovery. Uh, how does age factor into surgical risks and recovery? Excellent question. With any surgery, the older you are, the higher your risks. That's just fact, okay? Just like with, so anesthetists who see people before operations who put people to sleep will look at your medical factors and they'll weigh in, you know, do you have coronary artery disease? Do you have uh, problems with heart attacks or poor blood vessel supply to the heart? Do you have problems with smoking and lung disease and COPD? And these are all things that add up for higher risks for surgery. Um, so in general, people who are older will have more of those medical comorbidities. And so the risk for surgery is always individualized to a given patient. Most of my adults with epilepsy are pretty low risk surgical candidates, to be honest. Um, but if you do have a person who's a physiologically young 65 year old, it doesn't mean that person can't have epilepsy surgery. OK, and a lot of people think they're too old for epilepsy surgery, but there is no maximum age for epilepsy surgery. A lot of people who are in their 50s and 60s, and I think we've done someone, some in their 70s even, you know, there's no absolute cutoff age there. But in general, the earlier you go and the sooner you get this done, the better, uh, because you've got the rest of that life to live and improve on and your risks for the surgery are lower when you're younger. And then you had a question about brain elastic, like neuroplasticity, basically. I think you're referring to the fact that neurons are not going to regenerate. They're not something we can grow back. Like if you get a scrape on your hand and your skin cells regrow, we can't regrow neurons. Uh, that's, for example, why people with spinal cord injuries are quadrupedic. We can't regrow neurons, but what the neurons can do is they can rewire and they can reform connections with neighboring neurons that are working well. If, for example, there have been some neurons that have been chopped out, okay, or zapped with a laser or whatever. So neuroplasticity is generally best in a developing brain like in an infant and in a child. And we know for sure that when children especially go for surgery, that they have the most to gain because their brains are still developing. And as adults, it's not to say we can't still have tremendous neuroplasticity, but it is true that the older you are, the less neuroplasticity you have. It's not to say that it's not there though. And think about the fact that lots of adults with stroke, which is the most common neurologic condition, uh, will develop a plegia, a language deficit, a facial droop, uh, whatever their deficit is from their stroke. And over time, people go through rehabilitation and make all kinds of gains, even in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s even, right? So the brain has that ability to do neuroplasticity and rewire. But in general, your brain cells are more robust, shall we say, um, when you're younger, just like uh, any, any cells in your body and all organs of your body. Fantastic. There's one more question that, mm -hmm. that, that we have, and, and it really is, it ties into, you know, the, the release of um, Alison Hedges' book, um, Unashamed mm -hmm. and Unafraid, mm -hmm. um, where she talks about her conversation with Dr. Valiente around her brain surgery and depression. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they identify the fact that brain surgery often will lead to depression. Mm -hmm. So what are, and 
are there plans post-surgery for, um, for support in the event that depression mm-hmm. does ensue? Um, what, what are the plans for, mm-hmm. uh, for folks? So first and foremost, it's education and making sure that people and loved ones and care providers know to look for signs of depression. And with follow-up with your physician, it's, it's currently in our system right now, not something that we have a psychiatrist routinely seeing everybody, for example, because we don't have those resources, but it's about education, looking for the signs of depression, which the epileptologists do when, when following a person. But the timing of our follow-ups can be a bit um, arbitrary or it can be too late like we don't want to wait for somebody to see us in two months to to recognize that there's a problem and so a lot of it is informing people to watch for signs of depression and then should signs occur to contact their doctor and in the case of epilepsy surgery it's often our clinic or the epilepsy program um, and hopefully you've already got some kind of contacts whether that's that you see a psychologist or you have a psychiatrist psychiatrist that's seen you before, or maybe your family doctor you've got good relationship with, often this depression needs to be treated with medications. And it's not something that's your fault or that you can just will off. And the good news is it gets better. Okay, it's not like a lifelong depression that people fall into, but it is something that needs to be treated. And it's, in fact, the most uh, significant indicator of quality of life next to seizure freedom in a post-surgical group of people with epilepsy who've gone through surgery. So it's a really important factor. And I find that it's very common that people with epilepsy will have had some challenges with low mood in the past. Um, And so it's really important that if you've already identified yourself as that group, but you could be someone who's never had problems with low mood and this could still happen to you. Um, But it's really important that your mood and that your meds, if you're on meds and your counseling is is optimized before the surgery. Otherwise, we, we don't don't like to do a brain surgery on someone who's in the middle of a major depressive disorder and not getting help. Right. So. Right. Right. Well, is there anything else that you would like to add Dr. Razda? I believe, Oh, sorry. I see that there's more questions have come forward. Let's take a look here. Oh, can you explain about the MEG exam? Oh, okay. I debated putting the magnetoencephalography in, but I was knowing that I was going to run out of time here. Magnetoencephalography is another specialized technique that certain epilepsy centers use to better localize where the electrical vectors of maximal uh, electronegativity, where the electrical source of the seizure is coming from. And a magnetoencephalography is a big machine. It costs a lot of money and it's not everywhere. We have magnetoencephalography in Surrey, but the challenge right now is the skill set to interpret that data. But what that data is, is it's like a big fancy EEG, but there's way more channels and it looks more 3D than the EEG does. And it allows us to get more information about where that electrical activity is maximal. And especially in adults with epilepsy who don't have a clear lesion uh, with all those other nuclear medicine and uh, imaging studies that I showed you, this can be a helpful adjunct. Uh, It's mostly used in a research domain. Um, The main center in Canada that I'm aware of that uses magnetoencephalography for epilepsy is Montreal. And they do have uh, some epileptologist expertise in that skill and interpretation of that skill. But it's not something that is routinely trained uh, in regular epilepsy programs unless you're doing it as part of a research sort of a skill set. But I do know that there's some work uh, going on uh, trying to get this potentially up and running in BC. But that's all I can speak to because I'm not actually uh, in the health authority where they're looking at getting that going. Uh, but it's, uh, it is a, another tool that can help on top of the information I've uh, provided today. Yeah, it's a it's a, a great piece of technology that's actually manufactured here in British Columbia, uh, and and we're lucky we're one of only two provinces in the country that actually have a Meg. Um, uh, this may be superficial, but does hair grow back normally after a surgery? 
that's that's a good question yeah. yeah in general sure it does however um one thing i would say about the cosmetics of the surgery is that depending on your hairline and especially men who may not have as much hair up towards the front here sometimes the incision from the craniotomy extends in a way that you could still see that in front of your hairline this is something the surgeon considers when doing the skull um uh actual excision of the the brain if you have a craniotomy or even when you get depth electrodes through we try to put the depth electrodes so that they're not like right in the middle of the forehead because you you may be left with a tiny little bit of a scar there or where the hair may not grow back quite as as robustly i've used that word a couple times today um but in general yes the hair will grow back except for like any incision if somebody's had a scar like a man with an arm that's got a laceration and there's a there's like a, a mark there it may not be that the hair grows back perfectly in the spot where that scar is but usually it can just grow over it and cover it up great that it, you have answered all of our questions. Is there anything you'd like to add, Dr. Harasdale? Uh, well, just uh, thank you for the opportunity to give this talk. And um, I just strongly encourage people to uh, take this information as a source of optimism and uh, self-advocacy and uh, speak to your doctors about this. If it's an option for you, ask questions about it. Please don't shy away. I think it's one of those things where um, if you get your initial visceral response only, most people are going to say, no, thanks. Surgery is not for me. Okay. Don't touch my brain. But remember that there's actually a lot of sophistication to this, and it's not something that's done flippantly, okay? And uh, if it is something that you could qualify for and is recommended for you, I think it's, a, it's an amazing tool that could, could really change life for the better, so. Fantastic. Well, I'd, on behalf of BC Epilepsy Society, I'd like to thank you for you know all of your hard work, and, and thank you for participating on our professional advisory committee. Um, we appreciate your support and, and thank you for serving the British Columbians that are living with British, uh, that are living with epilepsy in our province. Um, we hope that all of the attendees have found tonight's webinar on adult epilepsy surgery to be helpful and informative. Uh, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at another one of our epilepsy expert webinar presentations in the future. Thank you so much. Awesome. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.